right, so we're sticking with our theme of quality improvement. This is my quality improvement project, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it today. So we're looking at the surgery, clerkship, <coughs> perceptions, and expectations. So the outline for today, um, I'm going to tell you about my sources. We're going to describe our UC Davis medical students. I'd like to go through uh, some of the data that I obtained and identify some problems that we have with our third year medical student rotation. We're going to discuss, attempt to discuss some potential solutions and then uh, hopefully leave enough time at the end for an actual discussion. As Dr. Farmer said, I'm very biased. I graduated from undergrad at UC Davis, was a medical student at UC Davis. And then I was recruited from UC Davis to start the vascular residency here. So I've been here the last 14 years. So take everything with a grain of salt. Because this is a bit of a sensitive subject, and I'm not particularly well known for my tact, I wanted to apologize up front. And I wanted to just set some ground rules. So nothing said today is intended to be inflammatory or malignant. There are some sensitive subjects here. Um, so please keep an open mind when you see some of the comments. You may f leave feeling a bit disappointed because there are no complete or perfect solutions that I can offer. But I, what I hope is to stimulate discussion and to start thinking about the medical students that we rotate with and making a better rotation for them. We're also not going to talk about millennial physicians coming through. We're not going to generalize them by their generation, even if the literature very much wants to. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, a lot of people. It apparently takes a lot of people to research medical students. And I want to, in particular, thank Dr. Fan and Dr. Carr, who are really allowing me free access to all of this data. They're really letting me do this expose with really <laughs> no censorship whatsoever. So I appreciate your bravery, and I think it really shows your dedication to our students. And so thank you very much. So this is where the data that you're going to see today comes from. So I have the uh, third year end of rotation evaluations. I have every graduating medical student at the end of their fourth year takes the AMC medical student graduation questionnaire. So this provides us data from all our medical students compared to the country. I have uh, some data from the LCME standards for accreditation, the NRMP match data for 2016, and then there's some information. There's a student-to-student -student orientation guide that is published online uh, on kind of an introduction to what the rotations are like. So I have access to that. I've included some quotes here from that. I have the orientation guides for a few rotations. I've used the clerkship logbook. And a lot of you, uh, which I very much appreciate, filled out my survey. My survey was uh, a multiple parallel surveys that I gave to students, residents, and faculty. It included a self-evaluation and then themes of teaching, feedback, and expectations. I then asked questions about the clerkship itself, including ranking of activities of where we think medical students should be. And then I asked for comments on how we can improve. 30 faculty filled out my survey, 44 residents filled out the survey. There was an even distribution. Get the rest of the data here, huh? Fortunately, it's not all showing up, but there was an even distribution of uh, PGY year who responded to the survey. 60% of the residents uh, said that they were slated for academics. 54 medical students fill out the survey. 60% of those were in their fourth year of training. And then this graph, which not all the data is showing up for, 18% of the students who took this survey said they were planning on going into either surgery itself or a procedural related field, so interventional cardiology, interventional nephrology, radiology, interventional radiology. And then this big chunk here is 36% of students who said they were slated for hospital-based medicine or primary care, but specifically something non-procedural. And then this chunk that you can't see up here is uh, emergency medicine, which was 11%. So who are our students? UC Davis Medical School 
is relatively small compared to the country. We have 415 total students. The average GPA is slightly lower uh, than it is for the rest of the state, and, but it is slightly more uh, competitive with a lower <laughs> acceptance rate compared to the state. It was named one of the top 50 medical schools in 2017 for both primary care and research. Most UC Dav or students at UC Davis are more often female, and they're slightly older than the average US student. They're married less frequently than the national average, but they have more children, and some have <laughs> a lot more children. Most UC Davis students carry between $100,000 and $200,000 of debt when they graduate, this total debt, which is a median of $165,000. So they're paying a lot of money to be here is the, is the point of that slide. This is match data from 2016. UC Davis residents, you can see, have a similar rates of matching into their specialties compared to the US. So we're training the same mix of students as the rest of the country is. So one of the, one of the <coughs> themes I saw from the residents was, oh, we're just training family practitioners. So UC Davis has a focus in family practice and rural medicine, but we are training the same distribution, the same people as the rest of the country is training. And UC Davis residents match into surgical and surgical subspecialties, uh, surgery and surgical subspecialties, the same rates in the country. Many choose to stay at UC Davis, and they become some of our top residents. And some of our favorite faculty members <laughs> came from UC Davis. <laughs> you can get all of this on the internet, which is great. <laughs> this is free access. So we'll talk about the third year clerkship. So when you ask, when AMC asked all graduating medical students if, what rotation, if it was good or excellent, the quality of the rotation, surgery actually ranks the second to lowest. So it's among the lowest of all UC Davis rotations, although it is on par with the rest of the country. So the rest of the country had a rate of 83% compared to our 82%. But when our students and residents on my survey felt were asked, they felt that the surgical rotation was not good preparation for a surgical career or a non-surgical career. But our faculty are much more optimistic. So my project is based on two hypotheses. So one, what we expect our students to do is different than what we tell them to do. And two, if we're not actively including medical students on the team, there's no impetus for them to participate. So first, we're going to talk about quotes that came from the survey. Um, and as a disclaimer, if you see your own quote, I've edited a lot of these so they fit on the slide. So this is a little bit old, but this is from the disorientation guide, which is a student-to-student -student guide uh, on advice on how to do all the rotations, what sites to pick. They have all of the attendings listed and what they like to hear. Um, throw your gown away for Dr. Pevic, these kind of hints for each other. Um, so here are some quotes. So people will ignore you and act as if you don't exist. Do not let this upset you. There is no way for you to help the team in any way. Your notes are useless, your presentations are too long, and you slow people down. On the other hand, you can get in the way, and you must avoid this at all costs. So on my survey, here's what the faculty say about our rotation. Students are not well integrated into the clinical team. They frequently leave from clinical activities. We give them no responsibility and set the expectations embarrassingly low. Here's what residents have to say. There's not a good way to let students help. This makes them feel useless and unwanted. Expectations on the rotation are often unclear to both the students and the residents on the team. And they never seem to be around. And some have an attitude about staying late. And here's what our students say. Because pimping has been discouraged, people avoid asking us any questions at all. The worst part is not doing anything, being useless and a net burden to the team. 
Students feel useless and sometimes behave accordingly, perpetuating the cycle. And one of the worst, in my opinion, after a week of no one talking to me, I stopped putting in any effort at all and focused on learning independently. So this is neither, these themes are neither unique or new. This is a study out of Beth Israel. They re recently published, um, it was out of an investigation into high levels of perceived mistreatment that was reported by the medical students. So they categorized mistreatment into two themes, so modern mistreatment, <coughs> passive mistreatment or neglect, including unclear expectations and failure to integrate your students, and active mistreatment or humiliation, so negative attitudes, fatigue, burnout. And these are representative quotes from the study and they're gonna sound familiar. Here's a medical student, in trying to be kind to me, they dismiss me of having any responsibility at all. And for active mistreatment, you can tell they didn't want to be here. They'd be late, wouldn't ask questions. So while I know there are instances of active mistreatment that occur, I'm going to focus today, the rest of today's talk on passive mistreatment. So our first theme is unclear expectations. <laughs> Most respondents of my survey did not think that students were given clear expectations. So as a way to test this, one of my expectations that, is that students show up to the operating room prepared. So I ask this question, and students think that they come to the operating room prepared, but residents and faculty do not. So to me, this was a good example of poorly communicated expectations. So students think they're meeting the expectations. They think they're going to the operating room prepared, but obviously we have a different idea in mind. And this is something that we could improve. We need to actually tell them what it means to be prepared when you're in the operating room because they're not, they're not seeing that. 61% are not seeing that. So let's talk about what we actually tell them up front at the start of the rotation. So they do have duty hours. They're limited to 80 hours a week and not beyond 16 continuous hours. And then additionally, surgery rotation itself imposes additional hour restrictions. So we tell them before they start that they are excused by 6 p.m. every day. Now as a resident, this is something that I was never told. So if my student tries to leave at 6 p.m., I never really understood that that was coming from above. So this is something that I wanted to communicate. We have told them they're excused by 6 there are exceptions for interesting or educational operations. They're excused all holidays, and they're expected to be on weekend rounds of no more than four days a month. So when you say, where is my student? Where are they? They always leave. Here's where they are. These are the requirements that surgery asks each medical student to do. So there are the service-specific meetings and activities, M&M, grand rounds. There's a half-day weekly of surgery didactic. They have doctoring or continuity clinic, half day a week. They're required to meet with their mentors, at least on a weekly basis, but some rotations have them meet more frequently. They have a trauma on-call night, which excuses them from their primary service, both pre-call and post-call. They have online cases they have to complete. They sh shadow anesthesia for a day. They have to do HHMPs, two observed examinations, and the shelf exam. And the other, thing, the other thing I got out of the survey from the residents is why don't third years, why aren't they as enthusiastic as fourth years? So why are they different? Why, is it because they're Davis students or is it because the fourth years are more interested? And I'd just like to point out that this is all we ask the fourth years to do when they come here. So we ask the third years to see a huge breadth of surgery and we ask fourth years to be on the team. So that's part of the difference, I think, that's observed. So our second theme is the failure to integrate students. So when I asked residents and faculty if they feel like they include students on the team, there are very high response rates. We feel very strongly that we're trying to include them on the team. Medical students don't agree. And when you ask overall, are the students able to participate as a member of the team, particularly medical students and residents do not feel that they are able to participate in a meaningful fashion. And this is true at other hospitals as well. This is a 2004 study from the University of Michigan, and they found 50% of medical students believed that they were inconvenienced. 
and 30% of residents and faculty also felt they were an inconvenience. 17% of medical students thought the faculty and residents would rather not even have them at all on their team. But all, almost all faculty and residents, 95%, wanted students on their team. So University of Cincinnati looked at this similar question, and they came up with a list of things that lead to exclusion of students. So unprepared or uninterested students, poorly defined expectations, poor communication, and resident need for patience, time, and inspiration to teach. So I specifically ask residents and faculty about these similar feelings. <laughs> so do residents like to teach? Do they take the time to teach? And are they approachable? And we think we are. But our perception of ourselves is not what the students are seeing. So there's a disconnect. We, we want to be approachable. We want them on the team, but we're, we're clearly not communicating that with the medical students. So next I want to talk about grading. So medical students don't find this rotation to be easy. Residents and faculty think this rotation is relatively easy. But medical students don't agree. And I think part of that is due to the expectations uh, that I showed you earlier, all the different places they have to be, all the activities they have to complete, in addition to being on the service for the first time. And they're not graded uh, on any, many of those activities. They're really only graded from their mentors and from the shelf exam. So if you ask them, well, is that fair? Residents don't think this system is fair at all. Um, and, but there's some agreement about 50-50 for med students and faculty on whether the grading system is fair. So here's some perceptions. These are quotes. So here's a student. Having the shelf be the most important tool for grading detracted from our experience in, clinical, in clinic and incentivized us to leave the hospital to study rather than to learn from our teams. Here's a resident comment. They are graded solely on their clerkship exam. There's no incentive for them to participate, so they just tend to be in the way and go home early. And here's a faculty comment. Too much weight is placed on the shelf exam such that actually participating in surgery and seeing our fields in a realistic and useful way is de-emphasized. So here's how they're graded. This is the scheme that they follow. If you receive two honors from each of your mentors that are assigned to you, then you, and, and you score above the 60th percentile nationally on the, board, on the shelf exam, then you receive an automatic honors. If you receive one honor from one of the two mentors and score above the 71st percentile nationally, then the IOR determines whether you are eligible for honors or a pass grade, and then everything else is pass or fail or incomplete. So across the country, they've looked and they've asked this question, how, how do you know what an honor student is? And they found that across the country, programs give honors grades to 0 to 67% of their students. And as is expected, there's poor inter-rater reliability in determining these grades. So they surveyed clerkship and program directors. And they said, here's a great list. This is what we think an honors student should have. They should have good communication skills, a good shelf score, synthetic ability, professional, no professionalism issues, etc. But the only one on here that is actually has objective data and can be objectively evaluated is the shelf score, which is how we ended up with such a heavy emphasis on the shelf score, I believe. And going back to that, that statement of we've discouraged pimping, so no one asks us any questions. If you ask medical students and faculty what we should be grading them on, just on a normal ward rounds, what we should evaluate them on, both say questions posed to the student and questions asked by the student. So this is important to them, and it's important to faculty as well. So now we're going to try and talk about some solutions. So I've identified some problems. Unclear expectations, poor inclusion on the team, and the grading is not representative. So obviously, we just really easy fix, clear expectations, expect participation, and reward participation. And the trick is going to be how. How do we do this? So clear expectations. So we need to include students on the team. So as a resident, who is this the personal responsibility of? Is it the medical students? They need to 
insert themselves onto our team and find a role? Is it the intern's role who usually interacts with the student the most? Or is it the chief's role who oversees the team? We should increase the time that residents spend with the students. And this means either changing their hours to more closely meet the residents. So an example, on the trauma service, it's the same team every three nights. So should the medical student work some sort of shift where they spend the most time with one team every three nights or days? And then this also implies that we need to condense outside learning activities. We need to decide what's important to keep and condense it either time-wise or total content. And this has been looked at. So this uh, paper in 2016, what they did was they put medical students on the same rotation, the same night float week as the interns were doing. So they had interns on an ACS service who worked a week at a time on a night float system. And they put the, in, or the medical students on that same time schedule. And they found that working the same hours as residents improved team cohesion and actually improved their shelf scores. So next category, expect participation. So this is a study out of the University of Cincinnati. They asked 178 faculty, residents, and students. And they said, what should medical students do on morning rounds? What are we supposed to do with them? And they said and agreed on getting numbers, doing dressing changes, examining patients, developing plans, and following on average two to three patients each. And when you, when you look at the data, you see that students very much want to write progress notes, even though they're not counting, even though they're not contributing to the patient's care, they still wanted to write progress notes. And they didn't necessarily want dedicated teaching, personal dedicated teaching rounds for them as much as residents and faculty thought they should. So for this goal, I think we need to have well-stated goals, including certain tasks for which they are primary, primarily responsible. So it's easy on vascular because we have a lot of wounds. So the medical student usually ends up gathering supplies and doing wound dressing changes. And that's an easy role for them to fill. Um, but there's also, we make packets for trauma. We make lists to run the list with numbers on it. Those are things that medical students do, can do. And it isn't scut if it's necessary for the team to function. I think students should write notes, but I have no idea how. Should they put it in the EMR? Should they put it under a dietary tab so that no one sees it? Do they need <laughs> stars across the top that says, please don't read for medical advice? I, I don't know how to incorporate this into the medical chart. So then do you have them write it on paper? And then who looks at those papers? The residents certainly don't want to be handed an extra progress note every morning and read through that in addition to our clinical activities. So I do think they should write notes, and I, I don't know how. And then I think we really need to ask the students questions. We need to go back more forward into pimping, but prepare them. So if you send them into an area in which that they're going to be uncomfortable, prepare them and be supportive of them. So finally, rewarding participation. So when I asked you all where medical students should be, where they should spend their time, almost the number one spot was the operating room. A surgical resident or a surgical student should be in the operating room, and that makes sense. But we're not grading based on that. There's no incentive for being in the operating room. So should we go, sit, uh, go on a path similar to we do for residents and have a hands-on benchmark? Should, we, should a third-year medical student who gets an honors be able to tie a two-handed knot? Should they be able to prove that? That's a surgical task <laughs> that is often acquired in the operating room or in practice with residents. Should we reintroduce the oral examination? So when I was a medical student here, we had an oral examination. You go into the room, and Dr. Holcroft scares you and gives, gives you a horrible vascular case, um, and then you join surgery. <laughs> um, the oral examination is a really good way uh, to get medical students interested in being pimped, because the medical students need to prepare for the oral, oral exam, so then there's that drive to want to be asked questions. And then 
is there enough faculty interest? And so one of the reasons Dr. Fan told me that it was the oral examination was taken away was because there, it was difficult to find enough faculty interest to take a whole day off and talk to a bunch of medical students and tell them some cases. And then at the end of it, how do you grade them? They, they sounded pretty knowledgeable and confident, so I'll give them a good grade. I'll honor them. And the, it's very, it ended up being very subjective, as most of these are. And then finally, should resident evaluations contribute to the grade? So if the resident is evaluating the medical student on the team, then it makes sense that the medical student will have more incentive to participate on the team. But who should write this evaluation? Should the medical student pick who writes their evaluation? Should the chief resident write the evaluation? Should the intern or whoever spends the most time with the resident, the medical student, write the evaluation? And how much should this con contribute to their overall grade? So I strongly believe that your students are a reflection of you as a teacher. Just as I've learned as a parent, your children are a reflection of you as a parent, whether it's for better or for worse. It's <laughs> my, my baby. <laughs> so it's not all bad. So I want to talk. I want to end with some good examples. So surgical oncology. 80% um, of the students that rotate on their rotation said that they feel included on the team. And 85% said that they were given clear expectations. So see, here are some of the quotes. I enjoy how the rotation was organized. Expectations were very clear. I felt very invested in by the residents and attendings on the service, and I was treated like part of the team. And I think what makes this rotation unique in looking at it is that it has a very rigid structure that sticks with the goals set out by the surgery clerkship. So each student is given a calendar, a fixed schedule. They're told that students are not allowed to uh, show up to work before 5 a.m. and they must leave by 6 p.m. One weekend day, they work per week and they're off the entire last weekend. And they're given one ex uh, exception to these regulations, and they have to tell their mentor when they use that exception. And the residents are told that the, the medical students are under strict regulations, and here they are. They have one overnight call with an intern, and a half day of reading time is assigned per week. So the other place that does really well, um, very, very well, is the VA. So 100% of students who rotated through here felt that they were included on the team, and 95% said that they had clear expectations. They want us to succeed and are patient in their teaching. They're doing pimping, and pimping was non-threatening and appropriate. The, they're engaged in our presentations, ask us questions, and create teaching moments. And what they do well is they set their expectations very clearly. So this is a quote out of their orientation guide. You should follow all patients for which you have participated in the operating room and those you have picked up on call. So this is an expectation as a resident that a lot of us have but maybe never say out loud. And I think the point in going through all of this is that some of these things <laughs> are implicit bias to have the medical student follow the patients they saw in the OR might need to be say, said out loud. But at the VA, it's written there in the, in the orientation guide. It also gives delineated criteria to honor, and it's very specific. They give examples of what to present on rounds, what things that surgeons care about, what things surgeons don't care about. and they. And Dr. Wiedemann actually photocopies an honor level H and P and includes it in the orientation guide. This is what an honors level H and P is. This is the standard. And they also participate, I think, more than the other rotations that I've seen. They write daily inpatient <coughs> progress notes in the EMR. They write clinic notes. They see their own clinic patients. There's an expectation that operative cases have a student scrubbed and assisting. There's weekly student presentations, and students routinely present two to three patients on rounds every morning to the whole group of attendings. And this seems to be working. There are a lot of, there's a lot of research on students underestimating their influence. So this is, these are a couple studies. 55% of students said that faculty and residents played an important role in shaping my career path. But only 5% of faculty and 11% of residents shared that sentiment. And when South Florida asked their medical students who influenced you to go into surgery, 41% said a faculty member, and 12% said a resident. 
So we do, we do change lives. We do influence uh, where they're going with their future or how fast, I guess. So I just want to end by talking about a couple good role models. So these were comments. I asked the medical students, who does it well and what do they do? And I'm not going to read all of these, but what you'll see, what I've highlighted is these themes that come up over and over. They let me participate. I was included. I received respect. There were high expectations of me. They took extra time. They were approachable. They involved me. They were clear about expectations. They were enthusiastic. They were patient. And they showed interest. So my summary is for faculty, I think we need to set very clear, explicit expectations of our medical students. For the residents, I think we need to find a way and force a way to have medical students on our team, have some role on our team, or at least consciously think about it, even if nothing changes. And for the students, I encourage you to find a way to participate, even if you don't think, even if you don't think that we want you because we do want you. It's just, it's difficult. <laughs> that is all. fabulous and really appreciate you for sort of taking the courage and the willingness to help us get better because I think without shining the light just as in our QI project without shining the light on these things it's really hard to know where to make a difference and you're right everybody's here because they want to be involved with teaching that is absolutely a true statement so we want to do it better and that's really great so we have some time questions wow lots so let's start um, with our one of our teaching experts. He was my medical student mentor. There you go. I was here. Yep. Dr. Peter. Early. Oh, I'm sorry. I think they are. Um, the doctoring and the continuity clinic is year-round, so that's half day uh, gone. Every Almost every rotation has de dedicated didactic time. Um, and then more and more rotations are moving towards online cases and supplements to the education. Um, the H&P requirement differs per rotation. We've gotten a lot of feedback in uh, end of rotation evals that eight is too many. Um, compared to the other rotations, so I don't think they have quite as many. Um, but then again, internal medicine, that's most of what they're doing when they're admitting. So I'm not sure how many they are actually doing. Um, we're just requiring them to review eight with a mentor, so it's slightly different. So what I've just generically, what I've found is, and why I focus the talk on expectations and inclusion is because the more cohesive the team is, the more the, resident, or the, more the students like the rotation. So internal medicine, they work much more closely with their, um, the interns and residents who are on the team. And they sit in the same room and they do tasks all day together as a group. And that cohesion of the team is part of what's driving their really very high scores. They had a 96% satisfaction rating. Um, and they're also they're, um, more driven towards the shelf exam. So I think surgeons are more focused on you should do things and you should operate and you should see things. And we just, our field is so expansive. Um, medicine, I think, is much more focused on preparing for the shelf. Here's the study you know, lecture, noon lecture of the day on a shelf topic. And, so, and that's not something that we do. But they see that as uh, driving them towards 
the goal at the end, which for them on that rotation is a difficult shelf. So we have a difficult shelf and a demanding rotation, uh, just external pressures, and then we are also ourselves demanding. So it ends up just a lot. <laughs> Dr. Ali? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and, and if you can make it so it fits right under my seat. <laughs> um, yep. The, the question is, I, I noticed that some of the things that you, that you talked about when you were speaking about the first and various challenges for the education um, were really kind of outside of our department and were incredibly cool. And I was wondering if, if you have um, any insight on whether that's being dealt with Right, so, it's, and it's a really, really good point and really important because I don't think the school of medicine is going to change this. I think it's going to stay the same. I think they're going to have doctoring because we have really good results with doctoring. And as much as we make fun of standardized patients and standardized encounters and interactions, it actually does improve the medical student, uh, the quality of their overall experience is what they found. And so, and then the continuity clinic is an actual clinic that the medical students rotate and see the same patients and carry their own primary care patients, which is within the goals of uh, UC Davis's primary care and rural health. Um, so I don't think the external pressures are going to go away. And so I think the smarter move is us as a department figuring out how we can work with these to make a valuable rotation. Because if medicine has these same requirements and they have a 96% satisfaction score, they're obviously doing something that works within their limitations and I think we can I think we can find a way to work within it but I don't think it's going to change. Dr. Galante. That's a uh, fantastic presentation. <coughs> Yeah, no, thank you. I think our current goal is do well on the shelf, um, as our grading criteria describes. But there is not any, at least in the literature, data linking shelf exams uh, scores with better match rates or increased uh, prestigiousness of a program that someone matches to. Um, the closest I found was that uh, study that asked program directors and uh, clerkship directors what they wanted in an honors level student. And they said they wanted NBMB scores, but in their review, they didn't find an association linking uh, quality and, or outcome of the surgical rotation in the NBME score. So I'm not sure it's a, necessarily a great measure. And hospitals across the country have shown different measures. Um, it is one of my goals to start getting the data of where our students match to. So I've been working with the Alumni Association, and what they're doing is they're tracking all of the UC Davis alumni and where they ended up matching and then what careers ultimately they ended up uh, finding. Because what I find interesting is we may match a lot of medical students to really good residency programs, but do they stay in surgery? 
did they know what they were getting into or did they leave and do something else afterwards? And so that data I don't have or know, but um, we are actually starting a big database to figure some of it out, Dr. Ben. Absolutely agree with that. That we on vascular usually have one, maybe two at most medical students. Usually one third year, if that, and maybe a fourth year. Um, and it's much easier to find a role for one student to perform on the team 
you have nine patients on your service, then one medical student carrying a bucket and doing wound dressing changes with us is a, is a good role for them and makes them essential to our team. But we had a month or two where we had three medical students and we had no idea what to do with the other two. So then do you switch off those responsibilities and it de-emphasizes the role that we had given that medical student. And so I just anecdotally absolutely agree. Um, the disorientation guide the, that's online, student to student, certainly talk about which rotations have more medical students and encourage students who want to go into surgery to find the smallest number of medical students. Um, but I don't have any particular objective data, but I do have all the scores of each rotation, so it is something that we could look at. Um, number of students assigned to a rotation and overall score of that rotation. Got some questions yes. on this side. Yes, I don't sir. want to get ignored. Uh, Melissa, I think one of the most difficult areas to integrate a student in the operating room, where you know there's so many stipulations on time constraints, quality measures, and supervision, and uh, trying to get the student involved at least part, you know, as far as assisting and cutting sutures and suturing, even just the simple thing of feeling a liver lesion, putting a hand in the abdomen, goes so far to kind of impact the student on kind of you know what surgery's about. And I've seen just students say, "This is the." something went off in my head. I just loved it once I was able to do neuro anticipate. But that's tough. Do you have any tips on how to get students more up front and involved? I mean, we're so concentrated in the case itself, and there's so many, and we've talked on previous talks about even resident supervision. How do you get the students more involved? So the comments that I um, have noticed of students who feel that attendings are doing a really good job letting them be involved, almost always say they let me do the first incision. They let me cut they let me cut sutures, they let me do the first incision. And students who are able to participate in any way, in any fashion, end up very happy with their experience in the rotation. But if we, if we do the first incision and we cut the suture and then they're retracting maybe at best the entire case, then usually they do not feel like they've participated. But even something as simple, Dr. Cancer has hundreds of evals that say, I'm so excited he lets me do first incisions. And that might be the only thing they do the entire case, but that's what the, that's what students are pointing out. So we have invasive surgery for Dr. Cantor. I guess my point would be I think that um, we overestimate how much participation we really need to give them, and I think the the bar can be very low as to any any participation. Just getting them in there talking to them while they're there, asking them questions, seeing if they're prepared to the, for the case, getting them prepared for the case, letting them cut suture. I think that's enough um, from my experience. It's when we ignore them, we have them stand in the back of the room, we have them retract, that obviously it becomes not a good experience. Sorry. So from a resident, prior resident perspective, so most, a lot, most except for those fabulous people that you put on the screen, most residents did not come from this medical school. We came from a medical school where medical students did not take two days of call a month, only the nighttime part of it, and they did not disappear here and there for didactics or doctoring. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but we have a different perception of what a medical student on a surgery rotation looks like. So I think for a lot of us, the, the face time with medical students makes us be more invested in their surgery. So when you have a medical student disappear, even though someone tells you they go to doctoring, I, I honestly, after all this time, have no idea what that means. <laughs> Except that they leave, they leave before they came, right? Or they leave at 5 p.m. because they turn into, you know, magic fairy dust and leave. And that's fine if that's best for their education, but it's just, it's, it's, it's different. And I think we do, my personal opinion is I think we do them, especially if we carry this into four years, we do them a disservice by having them take two overnight shifts a month. Because how on earth are people supposed to decide if they want to be a surgeon if they don't take overnight calls on a regular basis? And that's part of our, our life. And then the second thing is, and I don't know if this was true, and I don't know if it still is true, but there was a rumor floating around for a very long time, most of us believed it, that at the end of their rotation, the medical students were sat down by a person in the medical school and asked to go around the circle and talk about who on their rotation was mean to them, who hurt their feelings, who was that person. <laughs> and I think the culture has shifted and become that you don't want to you don't want to hurt their like you don't want to be mean. You don't want to be called out as being mean, reported to someone for being mean. And sometimes you, it's easier not to ask a question than it is to be perceived as mean or whatever word you want to put in there. So I don't know if that if that really does happen, but that's I think from a from a resident perspective, those are the reasons sometimes where we don't get our 
Yeah, no, for your first for your first point, I would um, just echo what, what Dr. Galante said. I think we need to decide as a department what our goals for these students are. And if our goals for the student are just to experience a bunch of things, then we need to reward based on that. And we as residents need to be educated that we're just trying to expose them to as much as is possible. We're not trying to give them a true surgical experience. But if our goal is to give them a true surgical experience, then yes, we need to change things and evaluate. I personally never sat in a circle and talked about my feelings, but I'm, there are debrief groups. There are um, lots of ombudsman reporting mechanisms. Um, and I understand the fear, but I don't know when we got past the point of, oh, they're going to hate me for asking them questions, so I'm going to ignore them. Mm -hmm. And whenever we transition to that, I think, is when we went from being more malignant to now being neglectful. And we actually so. had better scores before. Yeah, we did.
structure. I think um, it, it just kind of gave everyone a structure, which just helped everyone sort of uh, uh, Expectations are good. Their, uh, benefit from it. And the um, data at least showed that it was effective. So the scores, the average satisfaction scores, inclusion scores, uh, before the implementation of this structure were a lot lower than they are now. And I think that was one of the keys. Next students actually commented something similar to that and should there be different pathways um, or different experiences for people who don't have any interest and already know it in surgery so what we want to teach them is acute abdomen and maybe more general surgery whereas someone who's apt to going towards a surgical subspecialty maybe is more fit for a surgical subspecialty That's rotation a lot of we use so the yeah no it's it, it's always been it always struck me that we've got, we take some of the smartest people in the country, people who are finishing undergraduate medical students, <coughs> people who in other walks of life are starting big companies, you know, are at the prime of their um, creative career, and we essentially, you know, dumb them down as much as possible. You know, you, you can't write a note, you can't contribute, you can't. You, you can't do anything that your third grader could do. You know, you could pull out an NG tube, for heaven's sake. Uh, so it's just something screwy. Uh, I will say the goal of the surgery residency, just the clerkship, just to be clear, is to beat the psychiatrist in how many people <laughs> go into surgery and go into psychiatry. So just yeah. in case the expectations are <laughs> there, I just I want well. that, you know. Dr. Jim. All right, one last question. Somebody. 
So I, I didn't address that question because it's a it's a much bigger question and in the values of the medical s school to have this continuity doctoring program that runs through all four years. So I didn't address that question. I know from my own personal experience that I didn't find doctoring three as useful as any of the other doctoring years, but um, I had enough <laughs> that I wanted to address um, in this survey. So I, I have not addressed it. I think it's a good point. The notes, though, um, so medical students can write notes. Um, there are certain elements of each note which actually legally can count. So a, a review of systems and an HPI can legally count from a medical student writing them. But the issue our department, at least historically, has had is if a medical student writes a note that has a ridiculous plan and another team reads that plan and follows it, then it, it gets more messy. And so the responsibility, is anyone actually reading that note in the chart and checking it for accuracy and checking for it for being the right plan? And then it, it, if you have to do another daily progress note, so you have two progress notes, then which one is the consulting service going to read, or you're the consulting service, which one is the primary service going to read? And so it got, it got more messy. And so we had said, so just don't put them in the EMR. We'll eliminate that confusion. But on medical services, they do have third years write notes in the EMR. Um, and they write across the top, top in all stars. This is a medical student note. And that's how they decided to do it. So it is possible. Dr. Fan, you wanted to? So I think that's a work in progress. <coughs> I hate to close this yep. conversation because uh, I think there, we could do this for an hour and you can see there's lots of people with ideas. But let's get a group together. Let's take this on. Melissa, congratulations. Outstanding.